We, we want to talk to you today about some things, but first let me just share with you, we just came back from uh, Bogota, Colombia, and uh, we had phenomenal meetings over there with Pastor George Safar and his wife, Claudia. They had a great church that uh, COVID almost destroyed, and now they're back, and it's, it's up and growing, and it's exploding again, and it's really exciting to see what God is doing. Saw many people saved, saw people healed, lives changed, and uh, we, had, we had the privilege to do a, a weekend uh, conference with them. Also, the last, while we were over there in Medellin, we have been helping uh, Pastor Joel, and, and as he has uh, started a church there, he's John Milton's son-in-law, and him and his wife have started a, a church in, uh, over in Medellin, and we have been working for the last year. They've come to us and they look to us and ask us to be their pastor. And I'm going, well, you got that. They said, we understand it, but we feel like you're our spiritual father. And, uh, and so we kind of took that role on my wife and I. And uh, we've been ministering and talking with them over the last year. They flew over. We met with us here. We met with them over there. And they started uh, two weeks ago. And their first service, they had 600 and some people show up in their first service. But that, that's not the big deal. The big deal was out of 600 and some people, over 421 people got saved that morning. And I, I have some, I'll, I'll bring some video. I have it. I just didn't get a chance to get it to our guys. I want you all to see. Sometimes you don't see what you're doing. You just don't see it. We got a church over in Bradenton right now that we're involved with it with a group over there and, and Chad Spencer and his his wife and we're we're helping him start that church over there and, and you're involved in that. We're sowing seed into that, helping that. And these are young men and women of God that are on fire that are tearing it up wherever they go. And so we, we've got that going on over there. And we'll be sending you some videos and things about that. So, but just let you know that, you know, we've been busy. We were up in New York with my, my daughter and, and her kids. And uh, I'm glad that I live in Florida. Uh, I, I love to visit New York for a moment. And uh, I don't know how you can live there. But uh, it's crazy. You think our weather's crazy. He said, you're going to be about, it, about the, you know, you know, you go to hurricanes. I said, I know, but we know they're coming and we can get out of the way. I mean, I wake up in the morning in New York, it was 70 degrees, and it's 36 now. And the wind's blowing, so the chill factor is like it's down in the 20s. We were out the other night, and we, my daughter and I, and with the kids, and we were walking around, all of a sudden we walked out of this restaurant, and it's snowing. Thank God I live in Florida. But uh, Miss Heather and the kids are doing great, and a lot of things are happening, they're very, very positive stuff. So we've been busy. We've been doing a lot of travel. We, we, uh, my wife and I, we're, we've been staying very busy traveling around, speaking at a lot of other churches. I'm, next year, I'm going to be out about twice a month speaking, and God's opened the doors for us. And Because everybody's asking me about this, I want to get this out of the way so we can get on with what God has for us. What I do is really not important. It's what God's doing here in this house for you. Uh, because what I'm doing out there is this, it's just I'm an extension of this church, but I'm just representing us to help others do what God called them to do. But to me, to come home and see this wonderful, incredible gathering on a Sunday morning and know that what's been going on in this church and the miracles, the people getting saved, the lives that are being changed, what a year we've had, and it is greater this year. Amen? So, amen. Yes, yeah, celebrate, celebrate. God spoke to me a number of years ago, and we, we were in a service, and God spoke to me about a scripture that my mother used to quote all the time out of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, where it's, you know, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, or enter into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them. And it, and it bothered me because when I began to really think about it, uh, it, it says that he's already prepared for them, which means his past tense is already there. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which means you can't have, you can't have evidence of something if it doesn't exist. <laughs> it's already there. And, and so we, we need to understand that, that, that we live a life based on, if you will, uh, uh, not knowing, if we don't have the word of God and the Holy Spirit, we may live a life not knowing what rightfully is ours. The other side of the coin is that there's a lot of Christians who do not live with knowledge or understanding of what is rightfully theirs. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that there's nothing new under the sun. 
And everything has a season assigned to it. There's a season for everything. But there's nothing new under the sun. It says this. It says that everything that was already has been, and what has been, it always will be. That's what he says in the writer of Ecclesiastes says. So no matter what we're experiencing here, it's already been here. And you say, why would you go to that point? Because I believe we need to learn how to speak into what we call void or emptiness in our lives. Every one of us walk through these things in our lives that we feel like sometimes we just don't, either we don't have enough or we don't know enough or we can't see enough. There's something that's missing. And we all have gone through that at times in our lives. But we as Christians, we need to understand that God said, I'll not withhold any good thing from my children. God said there's nothing new under the sun. So everything that ever will be is already here. It's just that how do we identify it and how do we get it out of the unseen world into the seen world? And so as we begin to study on that, I was in a, I was in a service and as a youth pastor when I first got out of college, a seminary, and I was at, as a youth pastor in a church. And, and the man that I, I worked with, he had a tremendous anointing to pray for the sick. And uh, we were on a Sunday morning. I'll never forget it. It was a Sunday morning. We had about 500 people sitting in the congregation, and we were sitting on the platform. And it, uh, he said, come with me. And the, the music's going, and I walked off the platform and with him, and we followed back about midway of the, in the uh, auditorium there. And he went to this lady, looked at this lady, and he said, ma'am, I don't know you. You're a visitor, but uh, uh, w- would you please come and bring your son with you? So I'm going, well, that's a unique. He doesn't know her, but he knows it's her son. This is kind of, okay, so the Lord's really doing something here. It's going to be kind of, I didn't know what was going to happen. So she, he brings, she brings the boy out in the aisle, and he's sitting there talking to her. And he said to her, he says, so, and the little boy had a prosthetic eye. And you didn't know that. If you, I mean, if, if somebody didn't tell you, you wouldn't know it because it goes the way they had it done, and it was, it was incredibly done well. But he looked at her and he said, how long has he had a problem with that, that, with that with his eye, that prosthetic eye? She said, oh, when it, now he's about 11 years old or so, 10 or 11 years old. She said when he was really small, he was just you know, running around as a little kid, you know, four years old or so, he was playing in the yard and he fell into one of these points or, or these plants that has the point, pointed things on them real sharp and it went into his eye and they had to remove his eye. And he's had this prosthetic eye for a number of years now. And he said, uh, I know this is going to sound really weird. Can he take it out? And I'm standing here and I'm going, okay. I hope he doesn't ask me to hold that thing. I just. And so, and so the little boy reached up and he took it out and he had a tissue, you know, a little napkin there and put it in and his, his eyes closed. And he said, God spoke to me that he's going to give him a new eye. And I'm going, oh, God. If this doesn't work, I have no ministry. I have no nothing because I'm associated with this guy. And, it, you know, it, sometimes association can make you or break you. <laughs> I was seeing breaking real quick. And I wasn't in a lot of faith. I, mean, I, I, mean, I know all of you are all in faith all the time. Y'all don't worry about that. But I was struggling because I thought this guy, oh, God, you know, and I'm, I'm just kind of being cool, but I'm trying to figure out which is the best way out of here. And... Uh, and I never. He looked at her. He says, "He says you, you just got to believe that I heard from God. I didn't know you. I called you out. I didn't know you. your son had a prosthetic eye. I told you about it. God showed me that. So if God showed me those things, certainly God's going to honor my prayer." And she's just sitting there. She's going, "Okay," because she wasn't a believer. She was a guest. Somebody brought her. It's the reason you should bring guests. These signs are not for the believers. They're for the unbelievers, by the way. But anyway, so he put his hand over the, over the young boy's eye, and he prayed over him, and he, and, he, and he stepped back. And I'm standing probably this close, Mike, and I see when he pulled his hand away, there was like a mist, like a cloud right over the boy's eye. And I'm looking at this thing, and it's just there. All of a sudden, it's gone. And when it left, the little boy opened his eye. And he had a completely restored, creative miracle eye. Wow. Now, we, we, we talk about this in our book on speaking to the void. 
And so that got my attention because I said, you know, how many of us go through life accepting the circumstance rather than learning how to speak into the void or the emptiness? We, we've been so conditioned in the church to be moved by what we see, although we're not to live by what we see, we're supposed to live by faith. We judge of every, everything's on what we see and what we feel, and, and it's all emotional. It's all in, the, in, the, in, the, in this realm here, rather than what is, the, what, is, what is God really saying in our innermost being? It's the reason I love that song. <laughs> and so in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The very first thing in the beginning, it was the first thing that God did when it, when it comes to what we call mankind is in the beginning, before all things were, he created the heavens and the earth. The word create means to be absolute, shape, form, and fashion. Now get this in your spirit. When God created that, that, that terminology there, that, that, that God created, it means that it was done absolute. There was nothing broken, there was nothing missing, and there was nothing lost. God doesn't create anything without purpose, design, and structure. In the beginning, God created First, he created, he, he formed it, he fashioned it, he, he completed what he did. He, he made the earth the way it was supposed to be. Now, get that in your mind because when you go to this next verse, you find out the earth was without form or void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's amazing to me. He says that God completed everything. It was perfect. It was absolute. It was fashioned exactly the way he wanted to. But yet the next verse says the earth was up form or void. Form or void. Void is a, is, is a very, very u- unique word there because it, it deals with emptiness. It deals with that which is undistinguishable. It deals with that which is, is, is if you will, you can't identify what it is. It doesn't mean that there's nothing there. It means that what is there is so messed up you can't identify it. So we've always read there was nothing there, but then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep and over the waters, which means there's something there because his Spirit moved upon it. Isn't it funny how we do in the church world, how we accept certain things? See, we, we've taken this chapter and we've taught it as creation chapter. No, verse 1 is creation. What are, the, what are the next 10, 12, 14 verses? What, what is he doing? He's not creating anything. He's just putting back in order what already was. <laughs> it didn't have a form. It didn't have a shape. It, it, was, it, was, con, it was confused. Uh, it says, because God always creates a purpose, design, and structure, so where did a void come from? How did, how, did, how, how did the earth be so messed up that you couldn't identify anything about it? How could that be? Well, we know that over in the book of Isaiah, and I'm going to be quick with this because I want to get to this morning to a place we need to go to. And that simply is this, in the book of Isaiah 14, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, it talks about Satan and what Satan said he would do. In fact, Satan said this, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit upon, also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend high up in the clouds, I will be like the most high God. And we know that there was a battle in heaven and God cast Satan along with a third of the angels down out of heaven. Jesus said this. It gives us some more of an insight, an understanding here, because Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Hmm. 
We know John 10.10, 10, the thief comes up before to steal, kill, and destroy. And I've come, they might have life and have it more abundantly. So, you know, we, we, we are dealing with something here that, that Satan was cast out of, out of heaven because he said, I'm going to exalt myself above God. And God said, you're not going to do that. A third of the angels, and I don't, I don't have time to get into it because the book, we deal with this, but there's a lot of teaching there where it talks about where these fallen angels went and what happened. And that's another story altogether in the resurrection of Christ. Before Jesus was resurrected, he went to hell itself. There he preached to the fallen angels. There, anyway, we won't get into that. That's another story. Buy the book. Uh, where can you get it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they've got any here or not. So Satan was cast down the earth, and he created such a confusion on earth that everything God had created could not be identified. Amazing, isn't it? So how did God deal with that? How does God deal with voids? How does God deal when you look at something and it's empty to you because you can't identify what it could be? You know, if you can't identify what something is, it's meaningless to you. It's not usable. It's no benefit. But yet the earth was created God said, I created the heavens and the earth. He said, the heavens are mine, but I've given the earth to man. God says, I've given the earth to man. Earth is yours. Satan, when he got Adam and Eve to fail, he took over authority over the kingdoms of this earth. And when he met with Jesus, he tried to get Jesus. He said, I'll put you in charge of all the kingdoms if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, I'm not going to bow down and worship you because it's not yours to give. Right now, you have, the, you have the authority, legal authority, but you don't own it. You don't have ownership. And that's like a lot of Christians today. Satan doesn't have ownership of what he's doing with you, but he's got legal control of it because you've not taken your place. And so a lot of Christians go through life with lack. They go through life with struggle. They go through life with brokenness. They don't operate in what, what God has for them. God's spirit moved on the face of the, and then God said, and it says over 10 times, God began to speak. But when God was speaking, God said, let there be firmament in the midst. Then as God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. And then God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And the earth brought it forth. And so it says God began to speak, but what was he doing? He was using his words to put back in order what he had already created. Hmm. So the words that God used, his word, when he spoke it, they, became, they began to operate based upon what they were designed for. Your words that you speak, if they come out of a ready heart and spoken with the tongue of a pen of a ready writer, those words will begin to create, no, they will begin to redesign the circumstance and the situation the way God intended for it to be. Yes. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. I either speak it or I don't. If he will say to this mountain, be thou removed, we were singing it a while ago. <laughs> but how many of us are still dealing with our mountain right now? And so when we look at this void, this emptiness that each of us go through in life, it's important to note how did God deal with this? Number one, he dealt with it by his spirit. Everybody say by his spirit. Why is that so important? Because the Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. It says that if we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, which is the same spirit that God used to create with, it now dwells in you. So you have created potential in you. But how did that spirit work? It worked by the way God spoke. The way you speak is going to design the future you possess. How you talk about life is going to decide what kind of life you're going to live. When we deal with, with these things, we, we go through a lot of stuff. Be careful what you put in your spirit because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and if you're not careful, you're not speaking what the Spirit of God is saying. You're speaking what something else has been put in there. 
Psalms 33 and 6 said, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The breath of his mouth. God spoke into the void. No matter where your void exists, poverty, sickness, relationships, addiction, self-image, you can change your circumstance by the way you speak, Psalms 45.1. Your tongue is the pen of a ready writer, but it said, out of the breath of your mouth. Do me a favor. I want everyone to do, do me a favor. Take your hand, put it in front of your mouth. You got it there? And I want you to say, Jesus. Did you feel the air? You can't speak without air. You can't speak without breath. You can't speak without life coming out of you. Amen. The very life of God is involved in every one of those who have made a decision to receive Christ as their personal Savior. You're either going to operate with the spirit of man or the spirit of God. If you operate by the spirit of man, then you're limited to the flesh. If you operate with the spirit of God, you have no limitation. Nothing is impossible. I think we sang about that a while ago. How I speak and how I talk and how will I handle this? How will I deal with it? The Bible says a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day with the Lord. I wonder how long it took God. We called it seven days there. We called it the creation, but he wasn't. He was just re, He was really just re putting it back together again the way it was already created because he created it perfect to start with. So as he's speaking, I wonder how long it took for those things to come to pass. See, we speak it, well, it didn't happen. I don't know what I'm going to do. No, what do you mean it didn't happen? God is not a man that he should lie. Come on. So when I speak... If I'm speaking the word of God and I'm speaking it with the life of God in me because the Holy Spirit watches over the word of God, come on. So if I speak that, he says, then my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Death and life is in the power of that tongue. We, we talked about over in, in 1 Kings chapter 17. We heard about this morning already with the offering. And I love the term because I'm glad you pointed that out. It said that first off, it, first off, let's look at something a moment. There's a famine that's in the land. There's an emptiness in the land. There's something broken out there. And what's broken is, is if you go back and study the history of it, if you go back to Ahab and go back to his father and go back to his father and go back to his father, they all were very wicked kings. And they all had offended God and they'd all gone away from God. And Ahab had married a bunch of, of, of women and he, he built the temples to Baal and he was worshiping with them and he wasn't serving God. And God said, I'm done. And he tells Ahab, he tells the prophet, go tell Ahab, it's not going to rain because I'm done with his nonsense. Let me say something to you. If it's not raining in your life, then you need to go back and find out what you need to speak. Hmm. And so Ahab has not done what's right. But God said to the prophet, he says, now because you've been obedient and given my word, go to the brook Cherub. There you're going to have water and I've got ravens that are going to bring you meat. And then he came to him and he said, the brook's going to dry up, the ravens are going to come, but I have commanded a widow woman. Now it's important we catch this. I've commanded a widow woman. My word has been given to this woman to sustain you. She says, when he gets there, what are you doing? She says, I'm gathering sticks. I'm going to make a fire. My son and I have just a handful of meal, a little oil. We're going to make some cakes. We're going to eat it, and we're going to die. Now, this is her speaking out of her flesh, not out of the spirit. She had the word of the Lord, the spirit, but she's speaking the word of the flesh. One's life, one's death. I love what the prophet said. You go back, we won't read it right now, but go back and study it later. He said to her this, you go ahead and do what you're going to do, but you first do what God told you to do for me. In other words, I don't care. You want to die? Die. Die. But you better do what God told you. I need something to eat now. So can you imagine what goes through her mind is, good Lord, I'm going to die anyway. I might as well feed him. 
You, you can hear almost complaining in the kitchen, can't you? It's like a lot of us. We complain in the kitchen, parking lot, balcony, foyer. But lo and behold, because she operated according to the spirit and the word of the Lord, the meal did not cease and the oil did not cease till the famine had dissipated. It's a fascinating story. She didn't even realize it, but they were speaking into the emptiness. They were speaking to what she couldn't identify. Your chaotic situation, if you're taking notes, your chaotic situation is not of God. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, God is not the author of sickness, disease, poverty, brokenness, or loss. He's a God of life, a God of blessing, a God of healing. <laughs> Come on, church. Who is our God? God is not, he, he, the chaotic situation in your life is not from God. There's always a way out when you're serving God. God always have a, he, he always has a way of escape for you. Why? Because before you were born, before you were, you, you, you were ever born and brought on this earth, God said, I knew you before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. Therefore, when you came into this world, I've already created the eyes I've seen, the ear and I heard in the heart of men the things I prepared. I've prepared these for you. All you've got to do is learn how to be led by my spirit and learn how to speak my word. And I can tell you that void you're looking at is going to change. Number three, your purpose, design, and structure are clues to your destiny. Why am I here? What's the reason? My design, what am I good at? And what kind of structure have I applied to my life so that I can perform what I'm really good with? I, I, I laugh. I, 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 I'm all these up here, these singers and stuff, and I like... I just love the fact they get up here on Sunday morning and they just go, okay, let's go, and they take off and start singing. Y'all really know better than that, don't you? How many hours went in for them to do so we could get happy? <laughs> no, I'm serious. From the musicians to the singers to the people up, up top doing all the wording to the lighting. Do you, do you understand this didn't just all of a sudden we walk in here Sunday morning and, wow, look what God has done. Purpose, why are we here? What's the reason? Design, that is what are we gifted in? People that are operating in their gifts make it all come together. And the structure, what are we willing to work on so that our gift can shine so that our purpose can be received? If we're going to deal with the emptiness, you've got to understand the protocol. The kingdom of God is a protocol. And we need to learn how it operates. Number five, every void has an answer. Everything is confusing. There's an answer to it. There's, that God, God does not have anything in your life that he doesn't have an answer for. Number six, learn how to step out of your shadows or out of the shadows into the life God has planned for you. You must learn to speak God's word over your life. Begin to act like it. Begin to talk like it. Begin to walk like it. I... I you know, I, I'm amazed. I, I get around people, and, and I was talking to someone the other day, and, 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 and we're looking at them, and, they, and they're like 10 years younger than me, and they look like they were 20 years older than me. And when I told them my age, they just looked at me and said, how can that be? I said, because that's the way I live. My wife can tell I, I, I wake up in the morning feeling good. I wake up in the morning with anticipation. I, I wake up in the morning looking for what God's going to do today. I, 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 when I turned over and I was no longer senior pastor of this church, I looked at and say, what are you doing in retirement? Are you having a good time? I'm working my butt off. <laughs> I never worked so hard in my whole life as when I quit pastoring this church. I, I wish I had gone back to pastoring. It's a lot easier than what I'm doing now. You, you can't imagine. But that's why... At my age, 
I am able to do what I can do. That I, I, I go do things. You know, we go to Columbia and I'm speaking four and five times a day. I got guys who go with me that aren't even speaking who said, listen, I gotta go. I'm tired, man. I don't know how you're doing this. That's the truth. How is that? Because I've learned how to speak into that thing in the future that I can, you know, people say, I can't identify my future. I can identify my purpose. My purpose has not changed. Therefore, my gift, what is my gift? My gift is the ability to inspire other people to move to another level. So that's not change. So what I've got to do is make sure I'm spending three and four hours a day developing and studying and structuring and keeping it. So when the time comes, I don't just step out on the platform and go, let me see, praise and shout out. Okay, I know what I'm going to preach on. Plan your work, you work your plan, and then you talk about it. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, every time I get around you, you're always talking about sowing and reaping. I said, yeah, I know. He said, I can't, no, you talk about anything else? I said, not really. He says, I just don't know how you, I said, that's why you who you are and why I am who I am. He says, well, I teach faith. I said, that's good. Where did faith come from? Faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God. What's the word of God? Oh, it's a seed. I got you. Okay. <laughs> You can't even teach what you're teaching until you talk about what I'm talking about. So I'll talk about it every day. Why? Because I don't want any empty spaces in my life. I don't want anything that's confusing in my life. So I'm, I'm going to speak what God says. Words, what you speak determines the life or death. Words create actions. Actions create habits. Habits create lifestyles. Hmm. words create actions actions create habits habits create lifestyles when you speak you're breathing on a situation with the words that are coming out of your mouth what do they say in Romans 4 17 God calls those things which do not exist as though they did Mark chapter 4 verses 14 through 20 so or so is the word it's not what God has done with his word it's what we do with his word it's not what God's done with his word. He's already done. It's what we do with his word. The reason that Adam and Eve failed is because they did not keep the word. It wasn't just that they partook of the fruit. It's because they didn't keep the word. And when you don't keep the word, you go into confusion. And when you go into confusion, it gets chaotic. And when it gets chaotic, it becomes empty to you because there's no more value in it for you. Eight key words on the journey that you're going to take, and we're going to close with these this morning. Number one is imagination. Imagination. A place where dreams are birthed and your creativity is fed. Imagination. Well, I don't know about that. Genesis 11:6 said that they were going to build a tower of Babel and God came down to see what they were doing. He confused their language because he said, there's nothing that man can imagine that he cannot do. So he brought confusion to them because they wanted it for the wrong reason. Didn't say they couldn't do it anymore, just simply didn't give them the ability to see how to do it anymore. Oh God, help me here. He said, if I don't do this, they're going to build, they're going to get to heaven. So I got to confuse them with the language. Because if I don't confuse them, there's nothing they can imagine that they can't do. What about we as believers? I wonder where your imagination is taking you. Oh, we tell our kids, don't daydream, don't daydream. Don't daydream. I tell, tell my kids, don't daydream all you want to. Heather, when she was small, she uh, got hold of some of my, my wife's Hair, what, what did you call those things? Anyway, some things my wife put in her hair, whatever that meant. And uh, Pastor Kathy couldn't find them. She just bought them. She couldn't find them. And we knew that Heather had gotten them. And so I went to Heather and Heather, you know, what you do is, Heather. So, you know, I don't believe in sparing the rod. So I gave her a little whack and I said, oh, no, no, where it counts, you know, on the, on, the, on the adjustment side, not on the top side, but, you know. <laughs> And uh, 
I'm sorry, some of you need to have make that adjustment. But anyway. <laughs> and nothing. So my wife came in. She said, you need to talk. I said, I've already, I've already given her a pop, man. How we get? Okay. Boom. Second time. I said, okay, I've got to go to work. So I got a chair, put her in a chair in, the, in a room looking at the wall. I said, until you are ready to go tell mom what you did with those hair things, you cannot leave this chair. So I go to work. 12.30, my wife calls me. You got to come home. I said, what in the world? We didn't come home. Did she die? I mean, what <laughs> she says, no, she's sitting in there. She's not, she's not doing anything. We can't do this. This is cruel and unjust. <laughs> so I come home. To see, I mean, you were talking about two and a half hours, almost three hours looking at this wall. So I walk in. She's sitting there. I'll never forget it. She's sitting there. I said, Heather, are you ready to talk to your mother yet? She said, nope. I said, well, how long do you think you want to sit there? She said, Dad, I don't mind at all. I'm sitting here just imagining stuff. This has been wonderful. <laughs> so much for time out. Adjustment is better than anyway. Let's move on. Imagination is a key ingredient in every believer's life. You've got to get this in your spirit. Number two, you've got to move into the place of, where information and knowledge, it becomes the creator of security. Information and knowledge is a creator for security. I, I'm not going to get into a lot of this, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, it says, through great and precious promises, we partake of God's divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world. Through lust or inconsistency with God. Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4 says, Through wisdom is a house built. By understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. <clears throat> Information, knowledge is a creator of security. Transformation, revelation at work is, is where we change has to take place. You've got to be willing to change in order to deal with the circumstance you're in. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look not at that which is seen. Look at that which is not seen. Be willing to allow God to change you so that you can see things the way he sees them. My wife and I were talking about how through the years that we had and how the man had, had embezzled the money back when and we, we lost the 10 acres over on Banks Road. Now we thought our life had come to an end. Our ministry was over with. And then I look around here and I go, you know, God really knew better than what he did. We were just, we were trying to do what everybody wanted us to do and buy that property because everybody said we should buy the property and we, we did, we did. And then we lost it. You know why? Because that's not what God spoke. And my dad would say to me, this church here is our church. Why are the Presbyterians in it? I said, Dad, you can't do that. They built it. He says, they built it for the wrong reason. He said, that's our building. And I remember right up to, to the time that my dad went home to the Lord, I'd say, Dad, don't say that. He'd go, I'm telling you right now, that's our building. Sorry, Dad. But he was moved by, watch this now, but he was moved by the Spirit and the Word of God, and I was moved by the flesh and the Word of man. So I'm not talking about something I haven't experienced. I've been there. Unfortunately, some of you had to take the ride with me. Number four, you've got to learn how to be responsible. Responsibility, take ownership, make things personal. Joshua 1, verses 8 through 9, about the word of God, chapter 15, 7. If you abide in me, my words abide in you, you ask what you will. You've got to learn to be, take responsibility to be in ownership. Yeah, I love what you said this morning about the offering, but see, that's your responsibility. And until you took ownership, the offering meant nothing to you. Isn't that funny? But when you took ownership, you said, I'm going to be responsible. Look what God has done. It's a fascinating deal. 
We have to learn if, we, if we're going to move in that. This is so important we get a hold of this, this responsibility. Number five, accountability. Ooh. You've got to learn to be held accountable. Integrity of the heart reveals a person's character. Psalms 26, 1 through 8. You can look that up later because I want to move on with this. But accountability is so important. We hate being held accountable. We hate it. It's not something that most people really enjoy being held accountable. We don't, we don't want to feel like anybody's telling us what to do. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying, what are you doing? <laughs> Accountability. We don't want to tell people why we're doing what we're doing. But you need to be held accountable. So if somebody says, what are you doing? It's not because they're trying to tell you what to do. They're just trying to say, help me understand why you're doing what you're doing. Be accountable. Be accountable to one another. Be accountable to the body of Christ. Be accountable to, 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 to your job. Be accountable to your boss. Be accountable to your spouse. Accountability, that's very, very important. You know, you know, go through this all the time. We're counseling couples and stuff. There should never be anything hidden between a man and a woman that's married. No, no secret passwords. <laughs> Come on, folks. No secret accounts. No hidden money. Number six, commitment. I'll get off of that. Commitment. It's discipline to live. It will, it will pick your friends and reveal your enemies. Proverbs 16.3 and Psalms 37.5. But understand something that, that we talking about commitment. Commitment is, is, is going to di- cause me to be disciplined in an area, but it's also going to cause me to walk away from some people and enjoy myself to other people. Amen. Why do I want to hang out with somebody that's not committed to the same thing I'm committed to? I, I, I don't mean this unkind, but why do I want to hang out with an unbeliever for rather than hang out with believers? Why, why would I want to do that? My, 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 my commitment here is it comes into play. If I'm going to deal with emptiness, if I'm going to deal with that, then I've got to get committed here with this stuff. Adam and Eve, they, they messed up with their commitment. Persistence, number seven, persistence. Quitting is not an option. Remember, it's a battle of life and death. Psalms 27, 13 through 4, and James chapter 1, verses 3 through 3. Quitting's not an option. I can't just quit. I can't just walk away. Well, you know what they said? I'm not never coming back to that church again. The, these people are those unfriendly people in the world. Well, I thought you said God told you to come to this church. Do you think God knew those so-called unfriendly people were here? Or did God go, oh, God, I forgot. I should have told them. <laughs> come on, folks. You want to deal with the, 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 the chaotic situations in your life? Learn these things. Persistence. I can't quit. I didn't get involved in this so I can walk away. Blessed is man who swear to his own hurt and changeth not, is what the scripture says. Number eight, desire. Mm. It's a passion for life that which makes you feel happy and feel value. Psalms 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, this man, if he says to this mountain, there's not doubt in his heart, but believes, he desires that thing, it shall come to pass. The mountain will be removed. I love that where the mountain be moved. Yes, the mountain will be moved. Desire. I said desire. I don't know how you came to church today. I don't know what you came for. Well, I came to hear the word of God. Okay. I didn't. I'm going to hear the word of God. I know that's going to go on here. I'm teaching it today, but if I'm not, I come because the word of God is going to be taught. But I don't come for that. I come for God to paint pictures on the canvas of my mind so I can deal with the chaotic situations I'm going to face in life and I never live in a void, but I always live in the blessing. I didn't come to just hear the word of God. I come to let the word of God work in me. 
I know faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but faith without works is dead. Therefore, I need a design. I need the word of God to paint a picture on the canvas of my mind so I can see what God sees so now I can carry out what God called me to carry out. Desire. I desire to be in his presence. I desire to hear his voice. I desire to feel his touch. I I, I desire to walk in blessing. But more than that, I desire to be used of God to fulfill what he created me to fulfill. I like being used by God. I like it. I love for God to use me, take advantage of me. Has me go places sometimes I don't want to go. When I get there, I go, now I know I'm here. Has me love on people that I really don't love. And then after I do it, all of a sudden I realize I know why I did that because I needed that. The reason God says you love the unlovable is because you're really the one who needs to be loved. Isn't that funny? You're dealing with a hurt. You're dealing with an emptiness. So you love the unlovable so now you can know what love is. And now you can be filled and you can be fixed. Nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing lost. So we said God doesn't create anything without purpose, design, and structure. The Amplified Bible says that God prepared, formed, and fashioned the earth. The earth was created for man. We've already talked about that. God's given the earth to men. You know why? Write this down. Members, if you're a member of something, you have rights. But owners have responsibilities. I'm not a member, I'm an owner. I look at things differently. I was talking to someone not long ago. They had walked away and I said, it was easy for you to walk away because you never took ownership. He's like, you know the story, the, you know, the chicken and the, and the pig going down the road. And the chicken says, why don't we do a chicken dinner? Or no, pig says, why don't we do a chicken? I mean, I'll get it right in a minute. <laughs> They're going to do dinner for the church. But then they realized something as they looked at each other. The pig says, if we're, if we're, if, if, if we're going to do this, we're both going to have to give our lives. You gotta understand something. God doesn't want eggs. He wants the creator of the eggs. God doesn't want ham. He wants the creator of the ham. God doesn't want membership. He wants the owners. You were created to own. Look at the person next to you and say, You were created to own. That means you got a responsibility. Oh, I'm just going to cut. No, you can't come to church. You're an owner. Then you're going to act like an owner here. I know this sounds crazy. The other day I was out here. I was doing some things. I drove up. To something, and there's stuff. On, I got out of my car. I'm going, oh, I'm retired. I help build this thing, the grace of God. My son's now pastoring. This is cool. Where's, where's the... Where's Dan, the maintenance guy? Where's the, where's the people clean this? Oh, no, there's trash in front. Let me just pick it up. You know why? Because I'm an owner. I'm not waiting on somebody else to do what I owner should be doing for myself. You want to deal with emptiness in your life? Take ownership of your life. Be an owner. You have a responsibility. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens and the earth, who is God? He formed the earth made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, empty or in waste. He didn't create it in vain. Who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. Remember God as your creator and what the enemy has broken God by his word has not forgotten what the original looks like and how to put it back together again. Let me say that again. God is your creator and what the enemy has broken what the enemy has broken God by his word has not forgotten what the original looks like and he knows how to put it back together again. God eliminated the void with his spirit and with his word in faith. 
We will eliminate the void by the Spirit, His Word, and by faith. Here's my question. If you were fearfully, wonderfully made, what kind of picture would you present of yourself? If there was nothing broken, nothing missing, and nothing lost, what would your life's journey be like? Every one of us have emptiness. Every one of us has gone through brokenness. Every one of us has suffered loss. But God can put it all back together again. But you got to understand, my dad was 59 years old. You all know the story, four heart attacks. He lived to 89. He made his choice. When he made God on the Lord, he, he just lifted his Bible and said, I'm out of here. It's a great story. But God took everything that was broken, everything that was missing, and everything that dad had lost, and he put it all back together again. And we're a product of that right here. Here's the other side of that product. My dad lived with the confession that we're to be the lender and not the borrower, so we should never, ever be in debt. And guess what? This year, we fulfilled the dream of Bishop Woody. This church is not in debt to anybody. We're totally debt-free. <laughs> nothing broken. Nothing missing. Nothing lost. Bishop Woody spoke into the void back in the 80s and the 90s in the first part of this decade. And when he went home to be with the Lord, his words were the word of God spoken by the breath of God through Bishop Woody. And we're living the dream today that he spoke into being 35 years ago. I wonder what your life is going to look like when you begin to speak into your void with God's word and God's spirit. And you take those seven keys or eight keys I gave you, those words, and you begin to come down. But most of all, learn how to imagine. Just imagine. John Lennon thought he had a coin on that word with a song. Imagine. But his was a totally different kind of imagine. Imagine what it would be like if you could reach all the places God has put in your heart to reach now. Africa, around the world. How many times have you been over there speaking and thinking, oh God, if we could just do this? Well, I got news for you. When you're home, imagine it. Dr. Cho, and I'll close with this, Dr. Cho out of Seoul, Korea. Youngie Cho, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, had the largest church in the world. He built a church of over 1 million members. They would seat 45,000 people per service. I had the privilege to speak at the church and speak in that service. I had the privilege to know Dr. Cho. And he said when he got, a missionary came and he was there during the Korean conflict. And the missionary came in and led him to Christ and his family were all Buddhists. They totally disowned him. He said, I found myself living in the slums, eating maybe once every couple days because people were starving. It was during the Korean conflict. He said, but I knew that I had received Christ and God had healed me. And God began to speak to me about my nation, my country. And he said, the Lord said, I want you to start a church in the slums. And he said, God, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to believe you that I can start this church. And so the missionary was there. He gave him a little tent, and they started the church. So he was into that church about a year, and the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to begin to imagine a 1,000 members in your church. He said, Lord, a thousand members? Tent's not big enough. 
The Lord said, I want you to begin to imagine what it would be like to preach to a thousand people on Sunday morning. He said, he began to walk around telling people, we've got a thousand members. Now, he laughed at him. He said, you're a liar. He says, by the Spirit, I can see it. He said, I'd get up and I would close, or I'd get up in front of him and close my eyes and just speak like I was speaking to, to a thousand people. He said, about a year and a half, he went by and we had a thousand people. He said, the Lord spoke to him and said, why don't you imagine having 5,000? And then it went to 10,000. And then it went to 25,000. Then it went to 100,000. And he said he was praying. He had, they had over 150,000 people in his church. And he was praying that God said, now that you've learned how to operate and see things the way I see them, ask me for a million. He said, God, I'm going to preach to a million people. Ten years later, he's preaching to a million people. My wife and I sat in the Olympic Stadium in 1990. We had 250,000 people in the Olympic Stadium because all the church couldn't show up. Only part of them could show up for the meeting. 250,000. I said, Dr. Cho, he says, I learned how. He called it the fourth dimension. I call it the void. He said, I learned how to speak into the fourth dimension. See, everything you can imagine has already been created because there's nothing new under the sun. But by the Spirit and by the Word of God, you can begin to speak and it'll begin to paint pictures on the canvas of your mind that you can see what you've never seen before.